Hi, everyone, and welcome to Geeks in the Garden. I'm Karen, and I'll be talking today about time travel. We'll be looking back at last year's garden and cleaning it up to prepare for the new. We'll be talking about plants of our personal past that shaped us, and we'll be discussing plants that harken back from the distant days gone by. That's right. I'm Kat. I'm going to be talking about the impending return of Bruten cicadas. And I'm going to go over some plant news and we're going to chat about our winter sewing experiment. So let's dig in. So it is time to cut down that old perennial growth that is dead, clean up your beds, etc. We are putting the past to bed. What else can you purge from last year? It is a time of transition. And while some people do spring cleaning of the house, I much prefer to do spring cleaning of the garden. It's much more fun, considerably <laughs> less dusty. <laughs> if you're like me, you've probably left last year's garden largely as is over the winter, hoping to help out the birds and insects who need the dead parts to get through the cold. Now that we're in March, it is time to move on. From here on out, the dead stuff might harbor fungus, plus, you know, it just doesn't match my aesthetic. <laughs> Pruning down can also spur new growth, although this always seems counterintuitive to me, since lopping off one of my fingers won't bring back a better, stronger finger, unfortunately. So let's take one last look at last year's perennials brown bits, like Marie Kondo says, thank it for the joy it brought, and then move on to this year. It's pretty darn dead looking now anyway. Mow that stuff down. After all, it grew in 2020. How much do you really want to keep that around? Onwards and upwards, I say. This will be true for your cone flowers, sedums, ornamental grasses, etc. Cut them down to the ground and wait. They will almost certainly come back. I've got a few others I'm more nervous about. Perennials I've planted last year that I hope survived. My salvia, for instance, is probably touch and go. In that case, just prune and pray to whoever you see fit that um, it will come back up. Now, one question that often gets asked is about leaves. If you piled your autumn leaves on top of your beds, should you move them? You don't have to move them. In fact, you might put your mulch right back on top. That said, a big thick layer might make things tricky for new growth. So you can thin that out with a handrake very carefully. Um, one other question um, that people might ask is whether they are pruning something that maybe doesn't want to be pruned. And one way, if you're not sure, if you're looking at all your plants, you're not sure, scrape a little bit with your finger and see if um, it's green underneath. If it's green underneath, that's hardwood. Don't um, necessarily chop that down because that's going to, that's alive. That's going to take a long time to grow back um, unless you're specifically pruning a tree or something. So if it's green underneath, leave it. If it's totally brown, that is dead. Go ahead and take it down. Um, the other big thing right now is to pull weeds. It's pretty incredible how many weeds I see still hanging in there, having merrily carried on through ice and snow and storms. Get them out while you can see them and your new plant growth will thank you for it. That's great advice. And uh, we were talking about, um, you know, in different regions right now, it's, you know, here in Maryland, yes, March, we're getting our warm weather uh, coming sooner. Uh, some that are in five, you know, five, uh, zone five or six, you know, you still have a little bit of ways away. And, you know, if you don't want, if you want to ensure that you don't disrupt those winter slumbering pollinators and insects, uh, you can choose to maybe just clean up your front bed, but leave some side beds. Or Karen, you were saying you moved your leaves in mass to your compost heap. So those bugs still have you know, or pollinators or larva or whatever we want um, can still wake up where they are. Exactly. Yeah. We have a little ride, but they're all nice and safe. <laughs> Pile, I hope so. They're doing their thing. <laughs> All right. So our fandom feature this week is time travel. While we are taking one last look at back at last year's plants, it's well worth looking back into your own past to see what plants were special to you as you grew up. Perhaps as much as our pets or our playmates, some plants formed an integral part of us as we developed who we are. Let's time travel back in time to see just a few of our formative plants. And we would love to hear about yours too. 
For me, spring has always been my favorite season, and of course, with its spring flowers. One of my first botanical studies was done with daffodils when I was 12. I took pictures every week with my tiny little Nikon zoom camera for um, a couple of months at the same exact patch, watching it grow leaves and buds and finally flowers. Um, spring flowers and daffodils in particular always seem to be like this wonderful and startling rebirth, a sign of possibility and hope, even when good things seem impossible. Ball. Likewise, we had lilies in church at Easter, my favorite holiday, which is all about rebirth and hope. And so I named one of my daughters Lily because of that. Um, yeah, <laughs> Easter Lily. Trees were also an integral part of my childhood. My family regularly went on hikes, and I remember my mom having a tree hugger shirt when I was little. At the time, she was trying to protest all the development going on around our house, which was destroying so many beautiful trees. As such, I learned early on how precious and valuable trees are. My parents planted a cherry tree the year I was born, which I recently visited. It is quite impressively tall at 42 years old. <laughs> After we moved from that house, my favorite tree became a dogwood that just had the most beautiful white flowers in the spring. And we had a little white dog at the time um, as well who died at that house. So the dog and the tree are just connected in a lovely sort of way. Um, I really love that tree. I hope it's still around. <laughs> oh, I love that. Well, my plant past, it's not so much entwined with seasons, but in location. See, we we moved around so much growing up that, you know, I have memories of the riverbanks of West Virginia with the trilliums and the wild geranium or in Galveston, Texas, we had the wild flocks and dune grasses or the red clay of North Carolina where everything is hard to grow. My poor dad was out there with uh, building cold frames and running jackhammers trying to farm in that clay but we did have this lush forest in our backyard so uh and then you know the suburban hills of pittsburgh where my dad had a crazy front yard um with flowers and ponds and so it's not necessarily a particular plant or tree that holds my connections to my past because we really not we didn't get to return to all those former homes and gardens so it's just the act of gardening and community with nature that my you know, with my family that holds these memories like you. Um, my parents were very tenacious in tackling gardens despite having to move every year or so and, and then creating new homes so often. And I do laugh at how enthusiastic we were in trying to help my dad in the garden when we were young, but that soon turned into four of us in our teen years. Just, oh, I mean, like, it, it's like you and I asking our, our, our teens and tweens to help us in the garden. It's, yeah, <laughs> it's met with epic eye rolls and drama. So it's just, and then it just was very funny because all four of my siblings, we've moved on to just being you know, really hardcore gardeners and trying, you know, to learn new things, but also relying on all that knowledge from our past and just, you know, it, it just settled us into being unafraid to try new things because every time my parents had to start a new garden, they had to learn a new zone, a new climate, um, you know, and just, just my whole background of my, you know, grandfather was a farmer and just all my ancestors that were probably farmers or, um, so it's just being the best land steward that we can be. And I think you and I both strive for that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, while we just traveled back in time a bit personally, it bears mentioning that some seeds have traveled forwards in time, just like Captain America asleep in the ice since the 1940s. There have been seeds that germinated after thousands of years. A lotus seed germinated in 1996 after being in a dry lake bed for 1,200 years. In the 1960s, some scientists found a 2,000-year-old date seed, planted it, lo and behold, out comes a date tree. And then there's the Arctic flower, whose seeds were buried by squirrels 30,000 years ago, which scientists managed to grow into plants that showed different characteristics than modern, more evolved flowers. It's like Jurassic Park, but with flowers. <laughs> <laughs> Slightly less bitey, dangerous, you know. I mean, one would hope, right? But who knows? 
Of course, there are also plant species that have truly stood the test of time. Ferns have been around for 360 million years, unfur unfurling their fronds before flowers even existed. And then there's the ginkgo tree, which is one of the few that survived the age of the dinosaurs. As far as individual tree lifespan, the most impressive is the bristlecone pine, a tree that can live for 5,000 years. And I'm happy to announce that just this morning, I got Breaking one news. of <laughs> That's right. And now for a fast-breaking news story. <laughs> <laughs> My bristlecone pine seed has germinated. This is not a drill. It is coming up from the dirt. I was so excited. My whole family was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you're still talking about this. But what is so cool is that what is right now in my sunroom could still be around in the year 7,000, even if we're not. <laughs> I love that. That's truly from the past to the future. Totally. Very exciting. So speaking of the past coming back, <laughs> it has been 17 years since the East Coast has been visited by Magis, Magikita, Casina, well, I butchered that as I do with all, <laughs> uh, but <laughs> it's better known as the Cicada. So it doesn't matter if you are fascinated by bugs like me uh, or hate them with the fire of a thousand suns because they are coming. Yeah. Uh, our state of Maryland will be the center for this emergence. The cicadas are also expected to emerge in Delaware, Georgia, Illinois, Indiana, Kentucky, Michigan, New Jersey, New York, North Carolina, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Virginia, and West Virginia. So we've all, we have, we're all going to be hearing these. So can you imagine just peacing out for 17 years when they <laughs> dug down deep? It was 2004. Lord of the Rings, Return of the King had just cleaned up at the Oscars. Spirit and Opportunity had landed on Mars. The Summer Olympics were in Athens, Greece. And it was an election year here in the U.S. with Kerry versus Bush. And for me, it was great. It was a huge year because I got pregnant with my daughter after trying for several years. So, yay, yay. <laughs> but what does this return of brood 10 or brood X mean for our garden? Are these the 17 year locusts of legend and lore? No, these are not the locusts and grasshoppers that would devour your landscape like a biblical plague or turn your neighborhood into a dust bowl. But there are a few plants that could be harmed during egg laying time. Now, cicadas are a goosely white when they emerge, and they will climb upon a shrub, tree, or any vertical surface, and then they split their outside shell open. It's like something out of sci-fi. A giant red-eyed bug will emerge from this ex exoskeleton, and after a few days, take flight. Brood 10 is the largest of the cicada clans, and the song of the male cicadas will be deafening. There could be over a million and a half bugs per acre. Once they mate with the females, they will lay their eggs in the branches of trees and shrub, shrubs, mm -hmm. and when they hatch, mm -hmm. <laughs> the <laughs> tiny rice-sized babies will drop down and burrow deep, feeding slowly on roots, and they won't emerge again until 2038. Oh, my gosh. Gardening Alive blog writes that cicadas might harm, might harm younger <laughs> trees and shrubs a little bit when they feed gently as adults. And then more so when the females lay their eggs in the branches of these young trees and shrubs. Now, especially at risk are young fruit trees, their favorite sites for egg laying. Established plantings are not in danger, even if the number of cicadas on them looks pretty scary mid-June. But those new, let's say anything less than three or four years in the ground, trees and shrubs, should be protected. You can use a spun polyester row cover like the Rime, mosquito netting, cheesecloth, or in a pinch curtains. Uh, if you're planning on planting trees, wait until July. If your yard doesn't get cicadas by the first week of June, you're, it's probably safe for you to go ahead and plant. Now, because Brood 10 will cover 15 states, I would order that protective material now. So you can put it mm -hmm. on the second you hear that sound of that million plus bugs an acre um, when it gets serious in May. 
Oh my goodness, yes. I have got mine ready to go. I have done basically nothing but plant trees for the past two years. So um, yeah, mine, my yard is going to be egg laying central. I've heard some <laughs> horror stories from neighbors about how cicadas managed to inadvertently, of course, kill some young trees last time. And of course, um, I just have so many of them. So I plan on netting every single young thing in my yard. I love cicadas, but my tree nursery is not the place for their nursery. That's right. Sorry, and, cicadas. <laughs> <laughs> so just remember that cicadas don't bite or sting and they aren't poisonous. Their only crime is being loud and creeping people out. The National Wildlife Federation begs people to not use insecticides on cicadas as they don't harm our yards and they are a great food source for animals that eat insects. On a side note, Karen, <laughs> much mm -hmm. like in the movie Snowpiercer, there's a TV series too, but I haven't gotten to that part. But in the movie Snowpiercer, it's set very far in the future where bugs are processed as protein. Well, people in other countries that have sampled cicadas often say they taste similar to canned asparagus. Oh, yeah. I was actually uh, working at a culinary school 17 years ago, and all yeah. the students were learning how to cook them. We, <laughs> uh, I did not. I, I was a weenie. I kind of wish I had, but they were, doing, <laughs> they were frying them. They were chocolate dipping them. I don't know. You know, anything dipped in chocolate, really. I mean, you know, like maybe do it. The crunch is a little intimidating, but, you know, <laughs> we could get over it. <laughs> yeah, and, and we're, if we're talking about our more immediate future, there is an insect farm in France. It's called Insect with a Y, Y-N-S-E-C-T. And Robert Downey Jr., I heard an interview with him, his investment group, along with other venture capital investors, they're pouring money into this company because insects are emerging as a sustainable solution to several problems. Using a fraction of land and emitting way less carbon, they can turn food waste into feed and offer an alternative source of protein. The Amiens Farm, it's run largely by robots, mm. <laughs> futuristic. Whoa. It's going to produce about 100,000 tons of insect products a year, which will go into feeding fish, pets, and fertilizing plants. So if a high-tech bug colony doesn't sound futuristic, it's all happening right now, and they're going to be expanding the farm. Um, they're going to open an expanded farm in 2022. Now, here's what I want to know. Are those robots running the farm little Iron Men? Because if it's got Robert Downey Jr., I mean, come on. <laughs> I'm sure they'll slip one in there. <laughs> That's right. They're just zooming all over the place, making snarky remarks. <laughs> So it is time for plant news for plant people. Uh, in an article in Civil Eats, journalist Lydia Lee reports on how some cities and countries have restrictions that prevent people from gardening at home. In one Midwestern town, a temporary greenhouse had ended up on the wrong side of the law, revealing a value system that is distinctly regressive. Nicole and Dan Virgil, who live in Elmhurst, it's a suburb outside of Chicago, uh, they, they are dedicated vegetable gardeners. They maxed out their 2,000 square foot backyard with raised beds, um, having, you know, branched out from all the different um, typical salad ingredients that they were cultivating. And they wanted to extend that Midwestern growing season. So after doing online research, they built a high tunnel hoop house to protect two of their larger garden beds. Uh, it was made out of the kind that you see, the temporary greenhouse made out of plastic sheeting over a frame of PVC pipe and plywood. Um, a few weeks after the hoop house went up, they found a violation notice from the city taped to it. I thought it had bit to ha uh, I thought it had to be some kind of misunderstanding that it couldn't possibly be serious, recalls Nicole. She assumed that the hoop house, which was a lightweight temporary structure akin to a tent, wouldn't be subject to city regulations. Why would it be so cont contentious? Well, the Virgils are among many home gardeners around the country who have triggered a city or county ordinance that restricts edible gardening. It is fairly common for local governments to have a broadly written landscape ordinance, which may not typically prohibit vegetable gardening, but it does require grass or similar vegetation and calls for plants within a certain height. That neatly manicured yard that we always lament about <laughs> <laughs> has long been a status symbol, and the suburbs have historically differentiated themselves from ag land. 
A lot of rural land was developed into suburban municipalities, and the zoning code was changed to prohibit agricultural uses. People didn't want a pig farm to move in. So the goal of these ordinances, whether they're about landscaping or temporary structures, is to maintain property values. However, the perception that growing vegetables will drive down home values is not rooted in any evidence. Now that the pandemic shutdown is shifting our cultural attitudes, for the first time in a long while, people have seen empty shelves in grocery stores and witnessed hoarding. The past year has been a visceral reminder of how important it is to have access to healthy food, which no doubt prompted many to start planning. So the Virgils are advocating for a state right to garden bill, which would override these local ordinances. They've joined forces with attorney Ari Bargill at the nonprofit Institute for Justice, which works on constitutional law cases and just helped pass the first such gardening bill in Florida. Um, they see restrictions on home gardening as a violation of a fundamental right. We have the right to use our own properties to grow our own food as long as they don't impinge on any, someone else's freedom to enjoy their property. And he feels that landscape ordinances smack of authoritarianism. It, if a vegetable garden is attracting pests, it has a bearing on the health and safety of a community, and that should be regulated, he says. But if the government is acting like Disney World and specifying that your front yard should look like, that's not a vision of a free society. So the right to garden bill in Illinois has been through three rounds of revisions and should go before the state legislator in its next session, which is happening now. So we'll keep an eye on this because, I mean, it does affect everyone. Goodness. Yeah, I don't want anyone telling me what I can garden and not. Gracious sake. <laughs> Um, in news of a favorite place of ours, Longwood Gardens um, in Pennsylvania will begin a $6.5 million reconstruction of its Cascade Garden by artist Roberto Burrow Marx, originally installed in 92. It's one of the few permanent examples of his work in the U.S. and is part of a $250 million project that aims to revitalize the sprawling botanical garden and the historical Pierce DuPont family estate in Kennett Square, Pennsylvania. The garden consists of more than 100 rare South African plants, vertical rock walls, waterfalls, reflecting pools, which will be relocated under a standalone custom-designed glass house. It is embedded with the story of the rainforest and the plants he was passionate about, says Paul Redman, the president and chief executive of Longwood. Burl Marx wanted people around the world to be aware of these plants and preserve them, Redmond says. His advocacy for environmental preservation has found new pertinence amid the global climate crisis as human rights organizations call for the Brazilian president, um, Bolsonaro, to be investigated by an international criminal court over his management of the Amazon rainforest, which has seen rampant deforestation since he took office. Earlier this year, the palatial estate in Rio de Janeiro, where Pearl Marx lived and worked for more than two decades, which he donated to the Brazilian government upon his death in 1994, reopened after a $1.4 million renovation project began after the site was nominated to be named a UNESCO World Heritage Site in late 2018. The estate, which is teeming with tropical plants in the artist's signature grottos, remains a contender for world heritage status. The council meetings have been postponed due to the coronavirus pandemic. I can't wait to see like the, the full renovation of Longwood Gardens. It's oh my gosh, that is such, oh, I know it's our, both of our happy place. I mean, it is Disney World for plant people. It's insane. Nothing <laughs> like it I've, have I ever seen. <laughs> So we were just going to chat a little bit about our update on our winter sewing and how it's going. Um, so how's it going, Karen? <laughs> well, I hope it's going well. I have some winter sewing. Then I also have some seeds that I've started indoors because that's what it said to do. That's on the right. Packet. And um, so I do have some of those coming up. I've got some sweet Elysium starting. I've got some daisies. And it's just nice to see besides my awesome bristlecone pine, obviously. <laughs> Um, my sunroom's just converted into a nursery. Um, so I, I have some of those seeds starting there. No sprouts yet of the winter sowing. I mean, that's probably to be expected. Mostly I'm running into the problem of making sure it all stays hydrated. Um, is that the right word when it's plants? People are hydrated. What are plants? <laughs> I guess so. I don't know. Hydrated, watered, I guess. I don't know. They're watered. Yeah. They, they well, I guess what well, that would say when I'm drinking water, I'm watering myself. 
Right. Are we watering? Is it only watering yourself if you pour it on the outside? I don't know. I'm not really sure. But in any case, I keep going and checking and they're like very, very dry. So I'm a little worried about that and wondering if I should do something about it. But um, yours are probably in better shape because I think they're more shut up tight. Yeah. I mean, mine, I followed to because I was so nervous about it. I followed mm-hmm. exactly the, you know, I, I sat through a webinar by the woman who kind of invented uh, this and I, and I will have her name next time. I, it's, it's on the tip of my tongue, but um, yeah. So I pre moistened my soil um, and then I left lots of drainage and there's holes as well as the lid being on top. So I haven't noticed that mine looked dried out yet, but I know you were experimenting with some, you were experiment, experimenting with different um, receptacles of, you know, soil and different ways you were doing it. So I think it's all an experiment. We're, we're really interested. I, <laughs> and as I was telling Karen, I feel like the children who sit and watch these YouTube videos of the unboxing of toys. <laughs> I have watched so many YouTube videos of like people when it's like May of last year, when they were un unjugifying. <laughs> <laughs> when they were opening up their milk jugs and these like really robust, hardy um, seedlings were in there. And it's just, oh my gosh, it's so exciting. And I, and I, like, I literally sat there for 14 minutes watching this one woman struggle with untaping her uh, jugs because I wanted to see what was inside the jug. So, so fervently and I, I was just so excited. So Oh my yes. gosh, yeah. We need so, like enough reveals in our life. We need like <laughs> reveals. Like when you used to take your film to the photographer and then you'd see what was in the camera. Like <laughs> here you've got a reveal, which is very exciting. <laughs> so if you want to see some of those reveals, definitely like go to YouTube. But also um, you know, Karen and I are both in a couple of the Facebook groups for winter sewing. Just type in winter sewing and and you'll find them. I think there's three main ones um and people have posted photos there as well so it's 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 pretty exciting and we'll just keep updating you um and and pretty soon we'll have our own photos hopefully of our of our new experiment right. winter so we can watch you for 14 minutes <laughs> <laughs> i promise i'll, I'll make watch you on taping your yes exactly <laughs> so well, thank you for joining us today. We thought we'd wrap up the show by sharing some stuff that we're digging on right now. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I am digging the flowers that are coming up now, which aren't many, and I'm trying not to be resentful of that. I know spring is coming. They're kind of like teacher's pets. They get the most attention if they come up first, right? Like you just. Oh my so gosh, it's true. Them. I do not have many crocuses in my yard. Currently, those I have a, a couple snowdrops, and I have just a few crocuses. But those crocuses get so much attention. I look at them. I talk to them. I cut one to dry to put into my. Um, your my Dickinson. Dickinson style journal um, because I'm going to try and do that. Every time I see something blooming, I'm going to take one, dry it, and then put it in the journal um, for safekeeping. Oh, but, that's an awesome idea. Oh, yeah. It, it's exciting. It was a little painful cutting a crocus. Like, hey, welcome, flower. <laughs> but... <laughs> I'll save it forever, so, you know, um, but yes, and I've got the little tulips are just starting to peek out of the, you know, soil, and I, I, I one yard in my neighborhood has daffodils. I don't know what those people did to get their daffodils already, but um, I will one day have to accost them and be like, what the heck, man? But, <laughs> but um, yeah, so the, the small amount of flowers that are blooming, I am relishing a whole lot and I cannot wait. We're going to have some warm days this week um, in our area. And I'm hoping that that really stimulates a bunch more of the flowers. Yay. So I'm digging, uh, I'm reading a book called Companion Planting. It's by Jessica Walliser. Um, her book approaches interplanting varieties based on science. And, you know, she tries to get you to really think about the relationships between plants. Uh, I'm sure I'm going to talk about it more when I'm done with it, and I'm going to put some of the new concepts in play in my own planting this year. So Mm, That sounds fascinating. Love a garden book. All right. Well, please come find us on Instagram at Geeks in the Garden or um, on Facebook at Geeks in the Garden. You also can find extra content and details at our blog at geeksinthegarden.weebly.com or search on YouTube for our channel, Geeks in the Garden.
That's right. We've got to uh, update some more videos, including soon our winter sewing unveiling. So, oh God, um, yeah. <laughs> so please subscribe on Apple Podcasts. Follow us on Spotify and all the rest of the fine podcast streamers. We would love to hear your um, your tales of your past gardens or your garden past. Absolutely. Uh, you can send us comments and questions at geeksgardenpodcast at gmail.com and join us for our April episode where we'll be celebrating National Poetry Month with pros from the garden. We're going to have some special guests and have a conversation with herbalist Carrie and Candace from the Witch's Garden Podcast Ooh. and more. I can always say and more. <laughs> now go get dirty. And have some fun. <laughs>